Hi, I'm Stu Mashwitz, and welcome to Motion Stabilizing and Tracking. Motion tracking is something that every image compositor should be an expert in. It's a really important part of putting shots together, especially now that directors have been freed up to move their cameras around however they want to. Anyone who's considering a career in compositing images together needs to know how to do good motion tracking. Historically, visual effects work meant what are called locked off shots. These are called locked off shots because traditionally the camera was not allowed to move because the introduction of other elements to the shot would give away the fact that uh, they were shot under different conditions with different camera moves. And the shots are called locked off because it, this, this stability of the frame was so important that they would actually go to great pains to make sure that the camera was completely locked down and unable to move for the shot. Any little jiggle would result in inaccuracies between the two elements being composited together. If the director demanded that the camera move during an effects shot, a very arduous process of hand tracking elements into the frame would be required. Traditionally this would be done with a hopefully a motion control animation stand of some kind with a animator projecting the moving shot down onto some sort of crosshairs that they would then line up on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. This is only as accurate as the person was patient. Thankfully, digital systems have enabled us to automate this process somewhat. We can now do what's called motion tracking. And this is where algorithms that can recognize patterns that repeat from one frame to the next can be used to track where those patterns move through the frame. This technology has freed up directors of visual effects films to incorporate camera moves into any shot, including those that are going to require complex visual effects. There are two basic ideas we want to talk about here. The first is motion stabilizing and the second is motion tracking. Motion stabilizing is where that motion that we derive by matching the patterns in the frame is actually inverted and applied back to that same footage. This process in effect stabilizes the footage or removes the motion from the camera. This is not used nearly as often as motion tracking, however, where the motion from the shot is actually assigned to another element. And this is actually way more useful because in that way we can take the camera move that we actually want to preserve and we can make other elements appear to be stuck to that same camera move. Most motion stabilizing and tracking interfaces use the same basic conventions. And the two most important things we're going to look at here are what we call the pattern window and the search window. Sometimes these are called the pattern region and search region, but they're always basically the same thing. The smaller window inside contains the pattern that we're going to attempt to track, and the larger window that surrounds it contains the area in which we're going to look for that pattern. The search region is, only needs to be as big as that pattern might move on any given frame. As we cruise forward through the frames, that search region is going to move along with the pattern region, and it needs to be exactly as big as to encompass the greatest motion that that pattern might, might have from one frame to the next, but no bigger. But before we go too much into that, let's actually talk a little bit about that pattern window and the patterns that we're going to try to track. It's very important to have detail both horizontally and vertically. Here we're tracking something that has enough detail to track in the vertical direction, but not nearly enough in the horizontal direction. And what that means is that the tracker isn't going to move up and down at all, but it's, as it tries to find its points from frame to frame, it's going to drift all across this horizontal line. The ideal thing to track is going to be something that contains high contrast information in both the vertical and horizontal directions. The most ideal thing we could be looking for is some sort of X or plus shaped object in the frame. It's not only important to find something that looks like it's going to be easy to track, it's also important to make sure that that pattern is going to be as consistent as possible from frame to frame. Ideally, it's going to be exactly the same pattern on the first frame as it is on the last, and it's not ever going to have anything moving in front of it or blocking it from view. All of these things are going to confuse the tracker. 
It's also important as we're dragging out our, our pattern window that we don't just surround the pattern that we're trying to track, but we leave a little buffer around it. it this is important because we have to remember that we're not simply tracking a pattern, we're tracking the difference between the pattern and the area that surrounds it. And this will also help us out if there's any sort of imperfections or slop or drift. That little buffer will give us something for the computer to, to slop around in a little bit. All right, and now let's get back to our uh, search window. Like I said, this window is where this pattern might travel from one frame to the next. So why don't we skip forward a few frames here and see where our pattern is likely to move. We can see that it's pretty much going to move in one general direction and if we know that's the only direction it's likely to move over the course of the shot, we can greatly reduce the potential area that this thing might, this pattern might be found in and, uh, and cut down on the time that it takes to find this pattern on any given frame. The larger you make this, uh, this search window, the more likely it is that it's going to find that, that pattern from one frame to the next, but the more time it's going to take because there are more pixels to search for that pattern. The other problem you run into with a very large search window is that you can actually have your pattern hop from one similar pattern to another if there's another crosshair shaped or corner shaped object somewhere in the shot you could actually hop over to that one so you want to make sure that your search window is small enough to keep out anything else that might confuse the tracker just like it's important to make sure that your search region isn't too big it's also important to make sure it isn't too small the tracker isn't going to look for that pattern anywhere outside of that search window that you've drawn. If the pattern travels even halfway outside of it, your track is going to be off by that much. If you follow all of these rules, you'll give the tracking algorithm the best possible information and ensure that you can get the best possible track. There's one more very important thing to talk about when we're talking about tracking, which is the fact that the images that we're tracking on film are often going to contain what we call subpixel motion. If we zoom in very close to this object and watch it moving here, we can see that it's very rare that an object is going to move an integer number of pixels per frame. The pixels represent the image moving in increments that are much smaller than actually one pixel, and we can see that that motion is represented by that soft anti-aliased edge. What we're concerned with here when we track is that we don't just look for a white plus that's moving against a black background and how many single pixels it moves. We actually want to make sure that we can duplicate that same sub-pixel motion that's present in the footage. Most tracking systems allow for this. They allow for this by dividing the pixels of the image up into sub-pixels and tracking at a sub-pixel level. Most systems allow you to choose how sub-pixel you're going to get. They can range from half a pixel down to one two hundred and fifty-sixth of a pixel or even more high detail than that. Generally, you don't want to try to track anything with less detail than 1 16th of a pixel. And generally, you also don't have to go any, any crazier than 128th of a pixel. As you go into those extremely small sub-pixel divisions, you're essentially doubling and tripling and quadrupling the number of pixels that you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to track, and this is going to slow things down. What we're talking about here is a trade-off or compromise between time and quality. By the way, it's also important to note that as we're zooming in on our element that we're tracking here, we can begin to see the film grain again. The film grain stands to cause some problems for us, but not nearly as much so as maybe some video noise or other kinds of artifacting could be. If we're dealing with compressed footage or if we're dealing with extremely grainy or noisy footage, these are all things that are going to inhibit the tracker from catching the similarities from one frame to the next. A lot of tracking software packages have the option to do a slight blur to the image before they try to make the match. And this is actually a really good thing. A blurry crosshair is just as easy to track as a crisp crosshair, and a blurry one isn't going to be exhibiting nearly as much of that grain or video noise. So if you have a noisy image or if you're trying to track something that changes over time in a way that's undesirable because of artifacting in your footage, it can be really handy to do the blur before match. Usually a few pixels is enough, but don't turn this feature on unless you absolutely need to because it's just another thing that's going to slow down your tracking process. Up until now we've been showing a track on pretty ideal subject matter. That nice white crosshair is easy for us to spot and pick out as our good tracking subject and it's 
easy for the computer to track from one frame to the next. But oftentimes you're going to have to try to pull a track on footage that's less than ideal. And there are a few things that can be done to help this out. The main one is what we call resampling the pattern buffer, or resampling the pattern region. And this sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. If we're tracking something nice and consistent that doesn't change in terms of its general layout over the course of the shot, then we want to always be looking for that same information that we showed on the first frame of the track. Meaning on frame 100 of a shot, we're going to be asking the computer to look for the crosshair that matches the crosshair it saw on frame 1. But if we want to try to track something that's moving over time and changing its shape, we can definitely help out a little bit by resampling, resampling the tracking region. Something like a person's face moving in a crowd changes greatly over the course of a shot. And on a frame 100, it might look very different than it looked on frame 1. But we can rely on the fact that it actually looks pretty similar from one frame to the next. The changes from one frame to the next frame are not going to be that great. So what we can tell the tracker to do is to, instead of looking for what it found on frame one on every single frame of the track, we can tell it to look for what it found on the previous frame. And this makes it really handy to track things that change or, or morph over time, but it's not what you want to do if you're trying to track something like a crosshair. It's important to know which of these two techniques your tracking system uses. Some of them will let you know and others won't. Others will presuppose that you actually want to use this resampling technique when in fact you don't. Because this method of resampling or checking for what you found on the previous frame works so well, you might ask, well, why don't you do that in all cases even when you've got this perfectly good crosshair sitting here? And the reason goes back to the inaccuracies imposed by that subpixel motion we were talking about. Even though that crosshair looks the same to you and me on every single frame of this shot, it's actually not. As it drifts through the frame, the, the pixels that make it up are changing ever so slightly. And this is not very significant from one frame to the next, but as the computer tries to track and keeps looking for something that's just slightly different than what it found at the beginning, you can end up with a slow drift over time that by the end of your shot can yield a surprising difference in terms of where your tracker thinks that crosshair came from. Another thing that can happen is that for about half the shot you've got the perfect thing to track and then it either gets occluded by something else or it goes off the edge of the frame. It's very important to note that it's easy to halfway through your shot stop your track in process and assign that tracking window to some other part of the frame and resume the track tracking some other detail. Some tracking systems actually account for this and have a threshold that you can set whereby they will actually stop tracking when things become so different that they're reasonably certain that something is actually just blocking the point that they're trying to track. And the idea behind that is that then when they find that same tracking point again, they'll resume tracking and interpolate some pretty useful data in between when they weren't able to track. I would recommend not using these automatic systems. I don't really think they work all that well. And it's just as easy to notice for yourself that somebody has walked in front of your crosshairs and stopped the track at that point. And hopefully, you can find something else in the frame that's similar or, or near, near in the frame to what you were tracking and resume the track there. And then when the person's head gets out of the way, resume the track from the point that you started from. It's good to try to track an object in the frame that's more or less in the same plane in terms of its distance from the camera as the object that you're going to try to insert into the shot. And that also goes for when you're switching tracking points. It's a good thing to try to, if you're going to switch from one tracking point to the next, it's a good thing to try to switch to one that's similar in screen space and also similar in terms of its distance from the camera. And while it is handy to try to track something that is more or less in the same region of the frame as the object that you're going to add back into the shot or the element that you're going to assign this tracking data to, it's also important to note that you don't have to be exactly where this tracking data is. As you can see, most interfaces have inside of the pattern buffer, they have a little crosshair. And this is actually the physical location of where this tracker is going to assign that data. And we can move that independently of this window. We can scoot it even out fully outside of the window so that if you need to get a good track by tracking something that's off in the edge of the frame, you can still assign that data to something that needs to be stuck into the middle of the frame.
one last handy tip about tracking difficult subject matter is that sometimes it is very useful to track in reverse, starting in the last frame and going to the first frame. This is especially handy if you're tracking something that starts off far away from the camera and starts moving closer. If we start on the first frame, where the thing that we're tracking is really small, and we draw a pattern window around it that is similarly small, by the time we get to the last frame, that crosshair is going to be big enough that it's going to actually have gone outside of our little window. So in this case, it would be handy to track in reverse, to start by drawing a box that's as big as the crosshair ever gets, and let it track that crosshair even as it moves further away, because even as it gets smaller, it's always going to stay within the confines of our tracking window. So far, we've limited our discussion to tracking a single point within the frame. And this is very handy, but it's really only useful for inserting elements into shots that contain simple pan and tilt camera motion. Tracking additional points within that same frame can open up possibilities for us and allow us to track even more complicated camera motions. In addition to one-point tracking, there is generally two-point tracking, three-point tracking, and four-point tracking, although there are systems that go beyond that, and we'll talk about that later. Right now, let's talk about the benefits of adding just one more tracking point. If we track two points within the frame, in addition to simple position information, we can now also add rotational information. This is handy if the camera pans past something as it's tilted up or down, or if the camera has any roll move to it. Here you can see as we're tracking these two points, we're not only getting the position of the object, but we're also getting the rotation of it. And the object that we assigned this data to will appear very much locked down into this complicated shot because not only does it move with the shot, but it also rotates with the shot. The other thing that tracking an additional point allows us to do is to track the scaling changes of an object. This can be really handy if we're trying to match data on something that is moving closer or further away from the camera, or if we're trying to track something into a shot that contains a variable focal length or a zoom. Now we're tracking these two objects here, and as you can see, as they grow further apart, the distance between the tracking points grows further apart. And this distance can be applied to the scale parameter of the layer that we're going to actually assign this data to. One of the more complicated kinds of multipoint tracking is four-point tracking. And this is used when we want to try to match the perspective of an object. In this case now, we've got four points that we're going to track that represent the corners of something that in the real world space is rectangular. This is commonly used in cases like this, where we want to burn an image onto a monitor that wasn't there when the footage was originally shot. We can also use this to match other kinds of perspectives as well. This one is really tricky to get right. Here we're going to track all four of these points as this object moves through the frame. And we're going to assign this data to an effect that that's called corner pinning. And that does exactly what it sounds like. It distorts an element by pinning its corners into this data that we've created. And this will actually make it look like it's in a 3D perspective that matches what was there in the shot. There's also a simple form of corner pinning that can be done with three-point tracking. Tracking only three points eliminates the 3D perspective component that we got from our four-point tracking. It allows us to do a simpler form of, of corner pinning called affine tracking. This is far less useful than four-point, but sometimes you're just not going to get all four of those points staying in the frame the whole time. So three-point tracking is another option. There are actually systems that track even more than four points. And this is done when the simple suggestion of, of 3D that we can get by tracking the four corners and using the corner pinning effect isn't enough. Sometimes cracking information is actually needed to duplicate a full 3D camera move. In this case, we're going to need to track many more than four points. But in doing so, we can actually tell the computer enough about this 3D scene that it can do a pretty good job of simulating the actual 3D camera move that was executed on the set. Of course, when trying to match a complicated 3D move like that, it's very important to have additional measurements taken on the set for where those points are that we're trying to track. This will allow us to make a more accurate model inside the computer of that 3D space that we're trying to simulate. This gets us into shooting on the set for the best possible track.
as we talked about, the ideal tracking subject matter is going to be that, that beautiful white plus or crosshair. And when we're on the set, we have an opportunity to stick those wherever we want. Now again, we're going to have to strike a compromise here because we can put tracking points all over the place, but we don't want them to show up in the shot. So every tracking point that we put in the shot that helps us do our, our motion track is also going to be something we're going to have to remove later. Ideally, you can place the tracking point in an area of the frame that is going to be covered by the visual effects element that's going to be tracked to that point. Barring this, you want to try to use as contrasting a color for, you, for, your, uh, for your crosshair as possible. Not only will this ensure the best possible track, but it also might enable you to pull a key off of the color used in your little plus and remove it in some procedural way. Another favorite thing to have on the set as a good tracking target is a simple tennis ball on a stick. You can stick these into the ground and stick them places in the shot and they provide pretty good tracking targets and again are pretty, pretty easy to pull a key on or, or paint out later. As we talked about a common use of motion tracking is to uh, do what's called a monitor burn-in. This is done a lot in films because it's oftentimes hard to keep sync on something that's supposed to be on a monitor or a computer screen inside of the shot or it may not even, it may, it may, that screen may contain graphics or visuals that have not yet been prepared at the time of the shoot. If this is something that you've got to do, you can help yourself out by having an image present on that monitor that's going to be easier to track. You can have an image on the monitor that's just simple crosshairs at the corners and you're going to have a much easier time getting a good corner pinning track on that. It's also good to have that monitor on just because it'll cast a glow onto the actors and make it look a little bit more like that TV is really showing an image. If all you're going to be doing with these elements is a 2D track, then you really don't need too much more, inf too much more information about them than where they are in the frame and that they're going to hopefully stay in frame for the whole shot. But if you're going to do a 3D track on these objects, it's important to take detailed measurements of where they are in the frame, how, how far they are away from the camera, how far they are away from one another. It used to be that during complex visual effects shoots, this kind of thing was, was absolutely demanded. During Jurassic Park, for a shot where dinosaurs were running across a field, they put tennis balls every 10 feet on that field and, and went out with surveying equipment to find out exactly where those tennis balls were. They modeled this information precisely in the computer and got a very accurate match move. What's been happening lately is that people have begun to rely on the skill of artists who are talented with this whole motion tracking thing, and they've started to use fewer and fewer tennis balls out there in the field. And this is actually resulting in a, in a changing face of visual effects, which is that these match moves that we're generating off of these, uh, these tennis balls out in the field are getting a little bit less easy to rely on. Again, when you're on the set, you've got an opportunity to make sure that your final effect shot is going to be one of quality and, and it, this is the place to strike that compromise. More tennis balls means more work later painting them out, but it also means that you're going to have the best possible 3D match moves. For more information on 3D match moves, you can consult the programs on 3D later in the series. And for more information on painting out those match move targets or even removing them with a procedural key, you can consult Scott Stewart's program on rotoscoping and painting techniques. Currently, the most cutting edge technology in motion tracking eliminates almost everything that we've talked about in terms of pattern regions and search regions. There are actually algorithms out there that simply look at an entire image and follow the different patterns in the frame as they move from one frame to the next. And they're actually getting smart enough that they can be used to create a pretty accurate 3D model of what's in the frame and where it's moving. This is called flow field analysis and in addition to being used to generate a 3D representation of what exists in a simple piece of 2D footage, it's, it also has handy applications with motion tracking and may eventually eliminate some of the interface conventions that we've discussed today. I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on motion stabilization as I am on tracking, and the reason for that is that 
the situations in which you actually want to stabilize footage are pretty rare. And this is for a few reasons. First of all, it's an imperfect science. Even after you get something stabilized, chances are if it was moving around enough that you wanted to stabilize it, it's actually going to have some motion blur. And stabilizing it isn't going to remove the motion blur, so you're going to wind up with a static object that sits there and has a sort of bizarre blurring effect that overtakes it as the motion from the, from the camera is uh, isolated out. The other reason is just that usually if you wanted to shoot something without a move on it, it would be a lot easier to just go ahead and shoot it without a move on it. But there are times where it is really useful to stabilize things. One such example would be if you were shooting a blue screen element of some people walking around and you were shooting it from a crane and maybe the wind was blowing and the crane was bobbling around a little bit. You know, you're going to insert these people into a locked off shot. You don't need to do any motion tracking, but maybe you should stabilize that element for this reason that even on shots that don't contain camera moves, it's often very useful to go out there and tape some of these precious little X's or crosshairs or pluses into the frame. Even if you think that there's no reason that you're going to need to do motion tracking, sometimes you might have to do it even to correct something as horrible as a gate wobble that might be introduced by the camera not being in perfect registration. Scott Stewart goes into more detail about how motion tracking and rotoscoping are related to one another in his program on rotoscoping and painting techniques. Another technique that blends motion stabilizing and motion tracking together is called compound stabilization. Sometimes, for instance, in the case of a 3D match move that isn't quite accurate, you can end up with two things that are both moving together, but moving slightly against one another. If you have, for instance, a motion control camera out on the set, and you're shooting several passes that need to line up, but again that wind was blowing, you can end up with motion that matches more or less from one frame to the next, but what we're interested in is the slight deviation from one of those elements to the next. These two elements are going to bob against each other and they're going to spoil our shot. But we can't simply stabilize these elements because that overall motion that the camera is doing is very important to the shot. So now what we, get, what we have to do is a compound stabilization. We have to not eliminate the motion of any one shot and not assign the motion of one shot to another, but just eliminate the difference between those two motions. What we're saying is that we want one shot to move like the other, so the first thing we're going to do is make one shot not move at all. So we'll take the shot that has the motion that we want to throw away, and we're going to stabilize it. Hopefully we've got a good point in there that we can stabilize it out, removing the gross motion from that shot. And now we're going to go to our other shot, the shot from which we want to preserve the motion. And we're going to track, again, that exact same point and assign that data back to that other layer. And now what we've done is we've replaced the gross overall motion of one shot with that of another. And now those two points or those crosshairs should line up with each other over time and we can composite these two motion control moving elements together without them drifting against one another. Motion tracking isn't just useful for this rather dry application of inserting elements into shots with moving cameras. It can also be used for some sort of fun and interesting stuff. You can uh, motion track just about anything, whether it's an ideal subject matter or not, as we've talked about here. So I'd like to show you an example of a creative use of motion tracking. The art director on this project was able to shoot something under very low-tech circumstances in his apartment at night at one in the morning on high eight and using the techniques we've described today get a good enough motion track to produce this. 
here the uh, colored dots and stripes on the leotard are just as good at tracking target as crosshairs or anything else you might want to track. In this example, the fruit is tracked to the motion of the performer's body using a variety of the techniques that we've discussed today, including the two-point tracking used to track not just the rotation of the fruit to the arm, but by tracking both the shoulder and the elbow joint, we can actually also track the scaling changes in between there as well. I know this has been a lot to cover in one tape, but the final thing I'd like to leave you with is, like everything in visual effects, tracking, although it is handled with the computer, is not done by the computer. It is a manual process, and you do have to babysit it. You do have to watch what it's doing to make sure it's doing the right thing. If you do that and you follow the other techniques I've discussed here today, I think you get a pretty good track in most circumstances. If you have any other questions about this or any of the other visual effects concerns, you can consult the Masters of Visual Effects website. And there you can find my email address, and you can email me any questions you might have. In the meantime, why don't you go out there and try your hand at tracking something.